Um, good morning, everybody. We are live on um, Coffee with Osita Chikmo. We are connected on Gages now, just from the right line. Yes, we are. Good morning. Um, Okay. Uh, we're fine. So many people are signing. We are coming. Um yeah. Let's be sure that audio is you can see that I'm doing it now. Okay, I have it. All right, thank you very much and welcome to this episode of um, Coffee Chat. Today I have um, Kenneth Eriko here. Um, Kenneth is the is a partner uh, of PwC. He leads the tax reporting and strategy unit of PwC in Anglo West Africa. And he's also in charge of tax leadership in PwC Nigeria. He has many years of experience in dealing with tax and regulatory issues for companies in Africa and across different industries. He was an international tax manager at PW Johannesburg for a few years. He was part of the pioneer team set PWC's Africa desk um, in Johannesburg, South Africa. His major areas of specialization involve statutory audit, tax accounting, tax reporting, and strategy, tax structuring and optimization, assisting clients with tax and free compliance, tax due. Uh, diligence and helping clients with building models and tax applications. Of course, Internet is fellow of the Institute of Taxation of Nigeria. He is vice dean of the Extractive Industry Taxation Faculty of CIT and previously served in the Indirect Tax Faculty and Examination Committees. He is a member of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria and he has a certificate in International Treasury Management. From the position of Great Treasurer as UA, a diploma in information systems management, and holds a bachelor's of science degree from the University of Benin. So, this is a of introduction. Uh, Ken, good to be here. Very good. Thank you, Bossy. Um, Thank you for having me in this um, coffee chat. Um, looking forward to having a very good conversation. I mean, just start shoot. What start into the SGP? How much does tax contribute to our existence as a country? Do we have that information? Yeah, so now when you look at Nigeria's GDP, um, I don't have the exact figure. I, I think it should be about 380 or 370 billion dollars at the moment on an annual basis. Tax, um, the tax to GDP ratio is about 6% or thereabout um and that means that from a very significant base of transactions the government is only able to collect six percent when you compare that to other countries that's quite low um if you're looking at ghana south africa kenya um which would be typical countries in sub-sahara africa that you benchmark with um considering that you know um south africa is like the second biggest economy of course drives the southern um, um southern african uh, economy and then kenya drives east africa nigeria is not doing is not doing well at all because you know ghana and kenya do maybe 16 to 18 percent south africa does above you know 20 percent in terms of tax to gdp ratio um so from a competitive landscape nigeria is not doing well at all in terms of tax collection 
So, uh, I know most of my most of the followers here are very much interested in a lot of issues around that. But the one that is, um, that strikes at me is the 2019 uh, 2020 finance act seems to have more businesses could have been exempted from pay tax. Is it true? And at what threshold? Yes. So, um, I think the general threshold you look at for exemption is about 25 million annual turnover. Um, yeah. But one has to be a bit careful because the um, definitions in the Companies Income Tax Act is not exactly the same with the Value Added Tax Act, even though they both ref reference 25 million. So in the Companies Income Tax Act, um the 25 million references gross turnover um and gross turnover is actually defined so if a company is making you know 25 million um naira of turnover or less then that company's tax rate is zero percent the company does not pay you know you know any tax at all um and in the same vein if the um, the sale is um, below the threshold of twenty five million on an annual basis, then they do not need to charge VAT on their invoice to customers. Um, they don't also need to register. They don't also need to you know file VAT returns. So. For small businesses, that is a significant relief if you're doing turnover of less than 25 million. And in, in Nigeria, that you know, that population of companies is a lot. Um, so I think that's one of the massive reliefs um, that the Finance Act 2019 specifically um, introduced. Um, there are some other you know incentives you know particularly in the primary agricultural production industry that the government also introduced some incentives for um particularly um one of them is the ability for them to get ta a pioneer tax holiday um and the pioneer tax holiday for them spans um I think it's um, seven years. So they can do between four to seven years of tax holiday. Um, and then um, they are also able to get loans from banks. Um, and the banks, when the banks lend to them, the interest is actually tax exempt. So that also provides you know, additional um benefit in terms of the pricing of the interest on loans to small companies um apart from that the you know if you're in primary agricultural production you also get um you know accelerated capital allowances without restriction so those are some of the you know important benefits if you warehouse your business in a company and it qualifies as a small company which is you know the benchmark you should be looking at is about 25 million mm. um so 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 some interesting benefits coming you know coming from the finance act 2019 uh, and of course 20 the finance act 2020 just consolidated some of those reliefs okay so let um let's go back to the issue of collection in nigeria uh, I'm going to come back to discussing more about companies, individuals, and their um, capacity to pay tax. Let's uh, come back to tax collection. What are the major changes we're having with tax collection in Nigeria? Why is tax collection very low in Nigeria? What are major improvements? Okay, so one of the things that drives effectiveness of tax collection um is yeah, um the obvious one the utilization of the tax revenue itself um so when people see good roads they see electricity 
they have pipe borne water, uh, they have access to, to healthcare. It's easy for them to pay to pay um, taxes. Uh, and the developed countries of this world have been able to um, achieve that objective. When you get into that smooth, you know, that sweet spot where basic amenities, um, infrastructure is being provided. Um, it's actually easier. You discover that the most developed countries are the ones that also have the highest rate of compliance in terms of taxation. And it's obvious because if you're getting benefits from what you're paying, you're actually motivated to pay more. Um, but that someone would say that this is, is, that is that a chicken, yeah, yeah. Is that a chicken and egg situation. Absolutely, it's a chicken and egg. I almost said to stick. Chicken and egg was the phrase I was looking for. It's a chicken and egg situation because what you then find is that people are waiting for government to provide the amenities first before they contribute their taxes, which you know doesn't make sense because where would the government get the revenue from, right? The government has to tax people, so people have to contribute first for government to actually have the funds in order to provide the basics. Um, having said that, people, there, there are clear justifications, um, you know, when people say that government still needs to provide based on the limited amount that has been provided um, or that has been paid by, by, by people already. So um, I wouldn't say it's exactly chicken and egg because you can actually break the cycle. Uh, and we've seen this, happen in other African countries, um, not just the developed world. You can pick, you know, specific African countries where you can actually see this happening already. And Nigeria is not comparable to, um, to some of those countries in terms of tax collection. There is also so, the issue. Yes, go ahead. Go, conclude there's that also the issue. There's also the issue of culture, obviously. Um, there are cultural issues. Um, and I'll give you an example. Um, you know, when you look at insurance penetration in Nigeria, for example, um, this has got nothing to do with government. This is actually people insuring against, um, you know, the risk of adverse outcomes. But our um, insurance penetration in Nigeria is perhaps the lowest in sub-Sahara Africa. Um, and that is driven by, you know, cultural considerations where people, you know, are, you know, prefer to um, insure spiritually their assets <laughs> as against, you know, physically contributing to an insurance company to secure their assets and their belongings. Um, and we've, we've seen the same trend also um you know trickle into the tax space where people um rather prefer um to use their money directly um and provide um for family and friends and you know culturally you have that extended family than to contribute to the coffers of, of government so you know the tax culture in nigeria is something that needs to be worked on you know when i was in south africa practicing tax it was only normal that around February, you know, at the back of our minds, we know that we had to complete our personal income tax return. Um, but when you come back to Nigeria, that culture is not there. People don't think about, you know, the education. I think the tax education level is low, but even the tax culture and the adoption by people that even know is actually low. Um, so I think, you know, that is something that government needs to address urgently you know, if we are going to actually improve the, the tax to GDP ratio. Of course, there are other considerations around evasion, um, but I will just pause here because I, I think you wanted to um, ask a question, uh, you know, when I mentioned the, um, the issue of the chicken and egg. Yeah, <laughs> talking about chicken and egg, I'm always one of those who think we can have both for breakfast. Um, <laughs> we can eat the chicken and the egg for breakfast. But, um, but what I see here is um, a situation where we have a low tax payer base. Um, tell us about IGR. Are state governments really making progress on the intergenerated revenue? 
Are we making okay. progress? So I will, I'll tell you no, um, I, and I'll be very upfront with it, right? Now, when you see um, states like Lagos um, generating IGR of above 30 billion Naira per month, it is largely driven by pay as you earn. What you, um, which is the biggest, I mean, pay as you earn is a subset of personal income tax. But pay as you earn is what you get from employees. So the, you deduct from the employee's salaries and then you pay over to government. When you look at the, um, you know, the IGR profile, the breakdown of the IGR of states, you see that pay as you earn contributes usually above 70%, sometimes 80%, for some states it's 95%. Uh, and that's an anomaly. When you look at countries that have done well in tax collection, they rely more heavily on personal income tax. And personal income tax is not just what you collect from employees. It's what you collect from individuals over and above their salaries. So you can have, um, you know, what you would have find typically in many states is that you have people who are earning, you know, significant amount of money, let's assume 50 million naira per annum, um, but they are only declaring their salary income, which means that government is only able to collect pay as you earn. But you know that at a particular level of income, you're able to make investments. You're able to, you know, um, you know, invest in real estate, invest in, you know, agriculture, invest in other things. At that level, people begin to earn other income. But the government does not pay focus on that. Government pays more focus on pay as you earn because it's easy to collect. But what you find in other countries is that they do not rely on pay as you earn, they, de they rely on personal income tax. So after the pay as you earn has been declared, they go further to analyze the individual and profile the individual and try to find out are there other incomes that these people should have declared. Um, now, one of the you know, Oxfam reports that you will see shows that, you know, the um, richest 20% actually control about 80% of, of the activity in the economy or of the real, you know, the real value of the economy. You know, so if you're able to focus more on the high net worth individuals, um, who don't earn salaries, you may be able to make more, much more than pay as you earn. And that is one not the, the government has not been able to crack because it's just easier to pay as you earn. There's also the challenge that when you, you know, the difficulty of chasing after high net worth individuals and as well as the complication because they are also much more powerful compared to the salary earners. So that is, you know, a challenge and a knot that government needs to crack. The other point is that in other countries, they also generate a lot of revenue from real estate, landed property, um, in terms of rates, in terms of um, land use charge, in terms of property taxes. You know, if you go to the UK and invest in property and you want to dispose of it, you pay stamp duties, you, you pay capital gains tax. So that's also, you know, another um, area where government has not really performed in terms of, um, you know, tax collection. You know, if they're able to crack that knot, you remember that, you know, we are Africans and in, in Africa, we are traditional people. We tend to put our money in real estate. Um, government should also be able to focus the attention on taxing that wealth and focusing more on property and real estate. Um, at the moment, that is obviously um, an area that the states play. Um, so the federal government cannot play in that space in collecting tax in, at that level. Um, well, to an extent, maybe if it is owned by companies, they can collect capital gains tax 
but the states have not been able to crack that nut. Um, so I pause here. This is um this is very this is very very <laughs> uh, disturbing and very challenging because that's the reality of the Nigerian situation that our state does not have capacity. Um, our state does not have capacity, and that means a lot um, for Nigeria. It has a lot of implication. Being able to collect tax is one of the principal signs of state capacity. Being able Absolutely. to take out the you know what an individual owns and how much of it is profit and how much of it of taxes are paid uh, are critical to state capacity. So pay as you go should not be the only source of uh, the PIT. It should be personal Absolutely. income. All that Absolutely. you have earned in the course of your activities um, and all of that. So tell me. The, the 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 if the states are not improving on internally generated revenue our oil revenue our so all the revenues that we get in nigeria are the centrally collected taxes that is the company income tax um the oil petroleum profit tax where does our revenues come from you know as a country the money that we get to the foundation account my which comes from sale of oil but I know that a lot of it comes from taxes. Where are these coming from? Is the federal government the only capable body in terms of collecting large-scale taxes? Um, unfortunately, that's the structure that we have as a country where um, the critical mass and the capacity is actually centralized, right? So the federal, the federal land revenue service is the most sophisticated um, and the most capable revenue authority at the moment. Um, unfortunately, the difficult taxes have been ceded to the state, the difficult taxes to collect, which is chasing after property, chasing after individuals. Um, the most capable tax authority then focuses on the low hanging fruit, which is companies, because you know with companies, they are easy to identify they are easy to track they are easy to to tax um but that's the primary focus of of the you know the frs as well as you know if i also take the nigerian custom service too that's also a very easy tax to collect it comes through the port you know once the goods are declared at the port you collect the revenue and it's easy but the states have to chase after individuals that, you know, based on their place of residence and they can move from place to place. For example, I'm, I'm, a, I'm from Delta State, but I live in Lagos, but I could be working in Abuja. Um, so you then have, you know, that dilemma because the different tax authorities will be wondering where should my tax be paid? Um, and if there is no central mechanism to identify me and to share information across the states, then I could easily drop out of the tax net. Um, so that's that's one of the challenges that FRS, uh, sorry, the states, the states are having. Um, but apart from the personal income tax, when you look at South Africa, the biggest base of revenue from taxation that they get is actually from personal income tax and mm. this is typical of many other countries but in nigeria it's the, it's the reverse so most of our revenue comes from oil you know crude oil and natural gas so the revenue from royalties that the oil and gas companies pay as well as the petroleum profits tax that they pay as well as government's share of crude because NMPC um, is a joint venture partner um, in oil exploration, and sometimes under production sharing contract is also the operator. So government also has its own oil that it lifts from all these transactions. So when you aggregate that, you know the revenue from oil is upwards of seventy percent of what we collect as a country, um, and then you then bring in the 
um, company's income tax, um, you bring in the VAT, you bring in the customs duties, which then when you aggregate them, they account for you know the remaining percentage um, that that um, you know we we can share that we can share as a country. Now, that is why um, that this is the reason why um, many of the states rely on the central allocation um you know from the federation account on a monthly basis because if the base of what they're able to generate is low then they have to rely on what is you know generated centrally um even though we do not think that or i do not think that this is a sustainable way um you know to to you know meet up with the obligations of the state so can we go away with one with one interesting fact that has come out now? That in other climes, where the bulk of the revenue comes from are actually with the states in Nigeria. The taxes that give other societies their highest revenue stream is actually domiciled with the states in Nigeria. Is that correct? That's absolutely 100% correct most of the bulk of it comes from personal income tax in most countries um <laughs> so, even though to be fair even though to be fair um because it's always good to give a balanced view our rate of tax for personal income tax is quite low but that no, is not the only no, the reason problem the collection problem is another issue but i'm talking the about collection about problem is a bigger issue than the low rate yes so i'm saying that the fiscal federalism we have today is actually that the states are in control of the taxes that are supposed to give more revenue. That contrary to the feeling that is the federal government that is controlling the key revenues of the country, the states are sitting on top of them and not doing much with them. That's my summary absolutely. of that conversation. That, that is 100% absolutely correct. Because from yes. personal income tax, remember that the GDP is generated by businesses and the businesses are controlled by individuals, individuals. right yes um and when you look at a state like lagos state um it's easy to analyze lagos state. what we are doing is collecting pay as you earn from people that pay rent right hmm. the question is where are the landlords you know um because the landlords don't declare rental income through pay as yes. you earn yeah. Yes. So, but you know, you know, I mean, we, when we came to Lagos, you know how much a portion of our salary we used to contribute as rent. But you know, those those are actually controlled by individuals. If governments could just focus on that first of all, before they then go into even the land-based properties like the land use charge, um, you know, many states will be able to increase their IGR significantly um if they're able to crack it but to do that you need sophistication of the revenue authority um mm. you need them to you know one of the problems we have in nigeria is lack of data and the ability to identify individuals because you know when 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 i was giving birth to in um shell hospital Ogunu in worry somewhere you know they went to the local government and they just wrote my name on the piece of paper i can then get lost into the system right um as can me and pop up anywhere but in other countries they give you a unique identifier that goes with you for the rest of your life it's only mm. just recently that government began to look at you know um national identification number and make it biometric but even in terms of the 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 extent of the coverage of that scheme it is actually very low um but if we are able to clearly identify people then we can start profiling and then using technology to actually you know do proper tax administration apart from identifying people you also need to identify property too um and you know it, it's interesting that many states have not looked into geolocation um uh, as a means of clearly identifying land you know and it has to be 3d because apart from the land itself which is 2d there's also the three-dimensional level because you can raise 
five stories upwards. Um, and government should be able to have all that data in order mm. to be able to tax individuals and tax properties. So tell me, can state governments just do somebody just wondering here in the questions I'm seeing here? whether the state governments can collect personal income tax from federal employees? Um, the answer is yes. yes. Um, Correct. But the state cannot collect from um, the members of the police force and the members of the military, um, the, the, the staff of the, the Nigerian Navy, so anything that has to do with this security architecture controlled at the federal level, they pay their taxes to the FIRS. But for every other employee, so let's let's assume NMPC has a branch in Ondo State. You know, Ondo State should be, you know, based on the law, is um, authorized to collect the pay as you earn as well as the personal income taxes from those individuals as long as they are residents in Ondo State. So um, it, it's a, this is a very interesting point because when I was at the Federal Road Safety, all that we spend our time doing most times is tax reconciliation with state authorities. Sometimes we've posted the staffs out of the state and then they come back and said, oh, but they were here till this number of months. So you need to remit those taxes. So I just want to concur that yes, federal agencies pay taxes to state authorities. It was a, it was something we did, you know, regularly. With that, now tell me if you are a person in Nigeria today and you want to do investments, you want to do um, what are the tax-free channels you have if you are an income earner and you know your taxes are going to be deducted. Are there tax-free opportunities for you to do your retirement planning and savings? There are many, actually. There, there are so many. Um, some of them have been in the law for a very long time. Um, and I think from a fiscal policy perspective, government needs to relook at some of them. But they exist as they are. Um, and, I'm, and I'm going to name a few of them. Um, one of them, which may, I mean, one of them obviously embedded in the law is if you invest in government bonds. So if you invest in government bonds today um, and you earn, you know, interest income from the coupons from that bond, um, they are actually tax exempt. Um, if you invest in treasury bills, similarly, you know, um, they are tax exempt, but that's exemption for treasury bills will expire you know december this year wow. um that exemption for treasury bills there's also an exemption from interest on corporate bonds so if you invest in corporate bonds today it will be tax exempt and there are some um companies on the nigerian stock exchange that have you know issued bonds that you, you could invest in and it to be tax-free. However, same as treasury bills from, you know, um, I think it's actually 1st January, 2022, the exemption will end. Um, there is no clarity whether the government will actually extend the exemption into the future on those items. There is also um, any investment income that you earn from offshore when i say offshore i mean outside nigeria they are the investment income you earn whether it is rent whether it is interest whether it is dividend or royalties they are all tax exempt in nigeria as long as you bring them in through government approved channels what that you know simply means is that you bring in the proceeds from the return of those investments into your domiciliary accounts in Nigeria, then they are fully taxed, um, you know, when you're cap computing your personal income tax. There is also, um, you know, there's there are also deductions that you can 
that you can play around with and get some benefits from in terms of your personal income tax. One of them is if you have a life insurance policy. So if you have a life insurance policy or your spouse, um, or you actually take, actually, let me put it this way. If you take a life insurance policy or you take one on being, you know, for your spouse, the premium that you pay to the insurance company um, will not, will be fully tax deductible. So if you earn a hundred, for example, and you use 20, you pay 20 as premium to a life insurance company, then you will only tax the net, that is 80. So you get a deduction for the premium that you use to insure your life. Hmm. There is also mortgage interest deduction that you can get. So if you get um, a loan to develop a property or to buy a property and you occupy that property, the interest that you pay into the bank um, for that property will be fully tax deductible um, when you're computing your personal income tax, even your pay as you earn, as it were. Um, so there are many incentives um, that you can, you know, play around with when you're looking at your own personal income or your pay as you earn. So tell me about the pension, um, the current pensions act and those who want to do deductions above the 8% or the, the regulatory threshold, are those also tax exempt? Yes, yes, they are, they are tax exempt. Um, before, because there was an amendment. So the Pension Reform Act, um, as amended by the 2014 um, legislation, actually allows as tax deductible any contribution to the pension fund so if you contribute you know the statutory contribution it will be tax deductible in computing your taxes if you do a voluntary contribution in addition it would also be fully tax deductible okay mm. um so the eight percent that become that you mandatorily have to contribute if you do another five so total of 13 the full 13 will be tax deductible. Okay. The Pension Reform Act 2014 now allowed, um, you know, people to withdraw from their voluntary contribution tax free. So before the PENCOM came up with a regulation to correct that anomaly, you could actually have a situation where you contribute an additional 5% in month one in January. But because the law says, you know, withdrawals and payments from your pension fund are fully tax exempt, you can then go the next month and collect that 5% that you contributed, that additional 5%, and it will be fully exempt from tax. So you, by so doing, you're taking an income that should normally be subject to tax and totally excluded from tax. So you found out that some people were carrying their full salary <laughs> and contributing the full amount into their pension fund. So Pencom came up later um, with, a reg we, you know, with some regulations and guidelines to say that when you make a voluntary pension contribution over and above the mandatory, it has to be locked in um for five years mm. um and you can only withdraw after five years but when you withdraw you cannot withdraw more than i've forgotten the percentage i think it's 20 percent of the cumulative funds that have accrued in your pension fund so that people then don't abuse the tax exemption when they're withdrawing their pension fund so that opportunity is still there, but it therefore means that most of it will then be locked in until you retire before you can get the benefit of the cash. Um, so that opportunity of putting it in month one and collecting it in month two no longer exists. 
you have to keep it there um you can get some withdrawal from that voluntary contribution i think it's about 20 percent cumulatively but every other thing will then be locked in you know if you are 20 years and you've started making those voluntary contributions you have to wait until you're 60 before you can get access to the funds so that's the change that has happened with the pencom regulations <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, 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 um, but the but the good part is that your yeah, pension contributions, voluntary contributions, are deducted before tax. So, if you that want is. to take some more money towards your retirement, um, you can actually do that, um, considering That's that um, you do not have to pay taxes on it immediately. And even when you when you're being paid as a pensioner, it will not be taxed. It will not be taxed. Yes. Yeah. So so, so yeah. if if you can do the waiting game, yeah. you would have to think about you'd have to think about inflation. You'd have to think about devaluation of currency. Yes. Um in you know and and look at you know the trade off. Um mm. keeping the money until retirement versus um all that. But if you're close to retirement if you're close to retirement, I don't think it's a bad idea that you, you know, you push more voluntary contribution um, because so, at the end of the day, you start collecting it. So um, uh, Celestine is asking me here, um, are yeah. gifts taxable? For example, if someone gives one million naira to me today, and this is an important question here because every day, um, for most part of my adult life, all I do is to send money to people. Um, my husband is sick, and I send twenty thousand. Um, my child is out of school. You put fifty thousand. Um, this person died. You contribute hundred thousand. Now, are these taxable? Are there something I can do to reduce my tax burden by showing that I give gifts to people? Me, the giver, and the receiver of the gifts are those seen as income, or are these um, taxable income? Okay, inter interesting question. Um, one of the things I will say straight up is that um, our tax laws, which is one, one of the reasons why, why the Finance Act is very important, our tax laws really need updating um, on a periodic basis. And I'll give you an example. In other countries, there is an age where you automatically become considered to be a taxable person. But in Nigeria, there's no age category. So the taxable person is anybody that, you know, is involved in a vocation or trade or something. So if you see, you know, uh, and, you know, while I'm not saying this to encourage child labor, but we've seen instances, especially in Africa and even in, you know, Far East Asia, where you have instances of child labor, you see a child, you know, hawking to pay their school fees. But the way the Nigerian tax law has been structured, it doesn't have an age threshold. So if a 15-year-old is hawking and earns income in order to put themselves through school, the Nigerian tax legislation, as it currently stands, will should tax them. It is just that the tax authorities are not focusing on that in that area. And from a moral perspective, it just doesn't make sense. For them to focus on on such area okay um so one of the things we need to introduce into our law is something like it an age threshold in other legislations you also have a gift rule which is actually very important because you know abuse of gifting could actually be a means of avoiding tax okay but the so the law does not expressly say that gifts are exempt from tax. But what it says um, is that you tax income from a vocation, trade, or business. And therefore, if the gift is not directly attributable to a trade or business, then it should not be taxable. Now, I say this as an interpretation because I do not think that there, there has been any judicial precedent that has put this thing to rest. 
but I feel secure in that interpretation because it makes sense. Such that if you know someone is sick and you make a donation to that person, the amount received by that person would therefore not be taxable on the basis of this interpretation. However, the giver will not get a deduction for that donation or that contribution. There is no provision in the Personal Income Tax Act that allows a tax deductible donation to be made by an individual. However, in the Companies Income Tax Act, there is something called the fifth shadow that allows companies to make tax deductible donations. So if it's a company making the donation and the um, person receiving it is listed in the fifth schedule, then the amount will be deductible for the company. But for an individual, there is no deduction because the gross amount will be taxable and you don't get a deduction um, for the donation. Now, let me just touch on one point which is quite crucial. In that my interpretation, if the gift is directly associated to a vocation or business, then that gift should be taxable. So if, for example, by reason of a position held, and I can use political position, I use, um, you know, um, religious position, which is quite common, that you receive that gifting in the context of a vocation, then I think that the law, as it currently stands, should be able to tax it. Because the only reason why I am so a seed into the life of, of a man of God is because he's a man of God, and that is the vocation. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that is the context, you know, um, I need to, you know, just x-ray that gift um, situation. Even though, as I said, um, you know, a lot of these things have not been fully considered by the tax authorities because they're just focusing on pay as you earn. So, um, <laughs> this is interesting. So, the, so all the people that ask us to do giveaway on, on social media to send money, send to charge cards, all those are taxable on us, but they can actually receive it tax free. They can decide not to pay tax on it because that's um, it, it doesn't come from a vocation, right? That's correct. So, it doesn't okay, come from a vocation. Does, but why does the tax authority consider all the cash that has gone into a personal um, account? I have a personal current account. And when I'm doing my annual taxes, they consider all the money that has gone into my account as income. They do not allow for any differentiation. This was a donation. This was something that happened. They just say every income that comes into your personal income, into your personal checking account, is considered an income. Is that correct? That's absolutely wrong. That's absolutely wrong because, you know, the credit into my bank account could be from anything. It could be from gifts, as we've given an example here. Sorry, I yes. forgot something about gifts, that sometimes gifts could be considered for capital gains tax purposes. But I don't want to go into too much technicality, so I'll pack that. But you could have credit into the bank account, which could be a gift. You could have credit into bank accounts, which could be um borrowings because when i borrow from a bank they will credit my bank account mm -hmm. that does not make it income credits into my bank account could be movements from one of my own accounts to another so it is absolutely wrong to assume well i wouldn't say it's absolutely wrong because there's a reason for that but you cannot say that all the credits into my bank account um constitute income However, it is typical of tax authorities, not just in Nigeria, that they want you to explain your inflows. So when I was in South Africa and I was living in South Africa, I was um, actually considered for a desk examination. So the tax authorities actually took my bank, asked me to provide my bank account. And they saw an inflow. I think it was about 30,000 rands or something. I can't remember how much it was. And they said that it was taxable. 
I simply wrote to them and told them it was an inflow from the disposal of my motor vehicle because I was exiting the country. Um, and they discharged that assessment. It was seamless, right? Because I provided the information and it was easily discharged. Mm. Um, and in, in those countries, they do not do tax audits the way we do it here in Nigeria, that every company, you must audit the company. They profile the company, um, whether it is high risk or low risk. If it is low risk, the best they do is a desk examination, or the, if the individual is low risk, the best they do is a desk examination. But in Nigeria, it seems like the tax authorities focused their attention on carrying out audits on already compliant people, which is wrong, right? Because you're wasting resources, um, limited resources that you have and the capacity that you have, and focusing on the already compliant taxpayers. That's not what they do in other countries. What they do in other countries is that the high-risk individuals and high-risk companies are the people that are programmed for audits. And then they do checks on the lower-risk um, um, people. So, I mean, not to digress, you know, the issue is that you have to be able to explain what the inflows into your bank account is. Uh, and it's becoming a global conversation because in, in the UK, for example, they have the unexplained wealth order. And that unexplained wealth order requires you to provide explanations around your wealth um, so that, you know, if it relates to a taxable transaction, then be taxed. Um, and if you cannot, you know, explain it and it's from you know, um, graft or corruption, then the, t the um, relevant government authority is then able to, to deal with it um, accordingly. So this is becoming more of a global conversation. That's why if you're opening a bank account in a UK controlled jurisdiction, including the British Channel Islands, they would actually validate your source of wealth um, as part of the whole process and also ask questions or rather on whether you are tax compliant because now they have to share information with other tax authorities across the world on their you know on their tax residence hmm. okay so a quick question i have here what's your take on the river state versus firs judgment on vat uh that's a that's a tough one um, but I'll give you, I'll give you my From views. From a professional right? point of view. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So this issue um, is not a new one. If you look at the evolution of VAT, before 1990, we did not have VAT. We had sales tax. And sales tax was actually administered by the state. Before the state, the sales tax, we, we actually had the trade taxes, which was administered by the regions. In, you know, VAT is a modern tax mechanism. Um, and Nigeria wanted to participate in the benefits that other countries had recorded in terms of, um, you know, revenue generation. So, so around 1990, we then introduced VAT. You know, interestingly, that VAT did not repeal the sales tax, interestingly. Then in 1999, we came up with a constitution. And that constitution has in the exclusive list that has to be legislated by the um, federal government taxes on income, stamp duties, and customs duties. We did not mention VAT, okay? So the, the issue now is that River State is then saying that that falls into the residual, because it's also not in the concurrent, it falls into the residual which the states can legislate on. So there is actually, in my view, a gap in terms of the constitution. Even though at the time, in 1990, 
the state and the federal government came together and said, let us institute this tax because what we are collecting at the state level is not e effective or efficient. Because within the purview of the federal government, you also have interstate, which the state cannot legislate or collect. You also have cross-border, which the state cannot legislate or collect on. And when you look at the vast income that the government generates currently, about, you know, I would say 50-50, 50 comes from domestic, 50 comes from international, right? If I look at the Q2 report, right? And, and this may not be um, the annual position, but if I look at the Q2 report, it's about 50-50, domestic and, um, you know, international. So if we focused only on state tax, we would have not been able to collect on those international or the ones that come through or the transactions that comes through the port. So VAT is actually a good instrument, but I think that there's indeed a gap in the constitution and this can only be addressed at the Supreme Court level. Um, when the Supreme Court gives a judgment, then um, we would all have to comply. But having said that, there is an old judgment, a co-hotel versus the, um, I think it was Lagos State, the Attorney General of Lagos State, where it was said that the VAT Act actually covered the field and therefore Lagos State could not impose, you know, sales tax um, or consumption tax at the time um but that judgment did not look at the constitution which is what the river state governor um is looking at in this particular situation to say that indeed in the exclusive list and the concurrent vat is not listed so i think that issue needs to be addressed at the supreme court as it stands i hear that the frs is challenging that judgment um but, you know, if you are asking me for an opinion, I think that you have two legislations that are currently coexisting at the moment. Um, it just creates a problem for, um, for businesses and an additional body because, you know, if they say they only want to pay the River State VAT, then the FRS will come after them. And there are also gaps in terms of how do you treat interstate transactions where you have suppliers or customers outside the state? Um, and those will be issues that mm, I, I think um, in an opinion, uh, a paid opinion would, would not be out of place. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I hear you. Um, the, 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 I think it's a matter of the states and the federal government having some form of agreement because the taxes are cross-border and VAT can be collected at scale. But maybe the definition of who gets what revenue from VAT is what we need to define better. <laughs> Applying the same rule we apply to the petroleum revenues to the VAT um, doesn't appear to appears to me to be at the root of the conflict. So Absolutely. If you, collect, if you collect VAT in Anambra, then Anambra should get the bulk of that VAT. If you collect in Lagos, then I don't know what the formula is now, but I think there's something about the formula that the states don't like. Pulling it back yeah. into the VAT and then distributing it, you know, um, using all forms of criteria other than the source of collection. Absolutely. So, so you're you're correct. That that's the that's the main issue. Um, unfortunately, before we used to file VAT based on so companies that have branches in different jurisdiction in different states will file VAT per branch. Mm -hmm. So you can actually get data around the source of the transaction. But that was changed um, later on to simplify the process for everybody. Mm -hmm. um, so what you will see now. Even if you want to say, FRS, give me the source of the, the VAT by source, because they have tax offices. 
They have yes. pieces that are based in locations and say, give me the, the VAT per source. It will, not, it will still not be accurate because a lot of companies will just file their VAT based on where their head office is, right? Mm. Um, which therefore means that we would have to, you know, if we want to do this thing equitably to know the source, we may need to go back to the branch-based VAT filing. Um, of course, it would, it would increase the burden, administrative burden for companies. But you're correct that the issue, the big issue is actually the sharing formula. The first mm -hmm. issue is actually the 15% that is taken as cost of collection by the federal government, right? Um, and there are questions around whether that is too high. Um, I think, you know, remember that the VAT goes into the VAT pool. It doesn't go to the federation account. So there is okay. a silent acknowledge acknowledgement that VAT is for the state. So yes. federal only collects a cost of collection. Okay. okay? okay. Um, and then the, um, I've forgotten how it is shared between the, the state and the local government. But remember that the way the local governments have been formed is also a political issue uh, and something that we, you know, um, has been debated. You know, there are some states that have several you know, local governments and you get allocated the portion that goes to local government based on the number of local governments. And then there's also the other issue around, um, you know, even the um, sharing formula, you know, across the states based on land mass, based on population, based on, you know, societal development and so on. So I think if people can come to the drawing board and have an honest conversation, on this sharing formula, uh, I don't, I, I, don't want to also touch on the, on the much publicized issues around people saying that you know, um, there are products that are not being taxed in in specific states. Remember that for a federation to work, you actually have to have an equitable basis to move the and distribute revenue. One of the, you know, um, tax one hundred one is actually wealth distribution you know, moving the income across so that there's equitable development across the nation. And that's the only way we can succeed, I think. Okay, so <clears throat> thank you very much. We've gone through quite a lot of, um, um, the link is not loading, oh dear. Uh, there were a couple of people that I wanted to come on board and um, ask questions and um, let me see um, so let me try it again just before we, we close um, So this is the link. Um, if you are able to copy it and paste it on your browser, I believe it should work. Um, the link for sharing, I believe it should work. Um, yeah. So if you want to come into the studio with me, um, just click on that link and or copy it and then paste it on the, uh, on the browser. Um, I believe it should work. Uh, I believe it should work. Um, so we have gone through various issues here and um, I would like to start to wind it down by taking us back to um, an issue that many young people here are worried about. So many people are now trying to form IT companies, companies that they can sell or get foreign investors into. And uh, what would be your advice to any company, anybody that has any dreams of um, because most foreign investors are always asking questions around taxation, around how they can come in and exit with their money. 
Uh, many people are now setting up offshore companies, and the people are investing in the offshore companies instead of the Nigerian companies. Um, what would be your suggestion to the young people who are dreaming of going global, or at least going continental, in terms of that? Should they be Nigerian domiciled companies? Should they be um, foreign domiciled companies to aid? Uh, and what are the benefits? Okay. Um, there are many things I would like to advise them on. I hope I can remember all of them. The first one is that um, from my experience of working on many of these transactions, because I've worked on a lot of these transactions, either helping um, foreign companies to look at um, Nigerian startups um, in terms of carrying out due diligence and appraisals on those companies. I've also been involved in you know, helping companies to prepare for investment um, or to raise capital um, from, from outside. Usually with many of the tech startups, whether it be in fintech or in e-commerce or whatever sector, um, a lot of the investments you're looking at is US-based, um, coming out from you know, Silicon Valley, usually they like a Delaware structure to make that investment. Um, but for these guys, they, you know, if your company is good, they do not necessarily need you to have set up that structure at the beginning. They just need a viable Nigerian business um, with subscribers, um, with a proven track record and ta tax compliant. <laughs> so tax is always one of the deal breakers um, or one of the most critical issues when these guys are making a, you know, a decision to, to invest. Remember, they are coming from a jurisdiction where you know, they, um, they, don't, they do not joke with the tax authorities. There have been celebrities that have slept in jail for tax evasion. Wesley Snipes, Lauren Hill, um, you know, they went to jail because of tax evasion. So the um, US tax authorities, IRS, they're not, um, they're not joking around in terms of taxes. So they're coming with that mindset. So they also expect that when they're looking at your company, that it is going to be clean okay mm. so you you need to ensure that you are tax compliant as possible you know you're filing your returns you're computing your taxes um and you're not you're not cutting corners with that the conversation would actually be easier um one of the things i also want to advise for early startup is not to be in a hurry to set up a company. Don't be in a hurry to set up a company if you are at the incubation stage. Um, so incur your costs, right? Um, and have records of those costs. And at the point when you think you're ready to float a company, capitalize your company with that cost, okay? Um, it, it serves two purposes. The first one is that it's allows the investor to see roughly the sort of value um you know without looking at the potential of the company just clearly how much cost you have incurred you know from inception um and they can begin to start their valuation from there of course there'll be other things to look at in terms of valuation but it's good to start from you know with that record and then you capitalize your company with that the companies and allied matters are allows you to do so um, as long as you you have the records and um, actually you don't need to actually inject cash you can actually incur costs um, and, and use that to capitalize the company the other important thing about using that to capitalize the company is that your development cost and many startups i've seen do not take advantage of this incentive 
there is a research and development incentive that allows you to take 20% as a credit against your tax liability. So if you incur 100 million, as an example, you will get a credit of 20 million, which can to offset your company's income tax liability at any point in time when you begin to record profits. Mm -hmm. So that is also another important consideration why I think you know you need to you know pace yourself, incur your cost, get ready when you're ready for a company, capitalize your company, and then you begin to you know um, to improve as you go on. And if your company is focused on the Nigerian market, you do not necessarily and uh, if it is Nigeria focused, then you do not necessarily need to set up a foreign hold, holding company. Um, many people set up, the, those companies come at a cost. Um, I saw, um, I've forgotten his name, the, the um, Paga, I've forgotten the name of the founder, where he was complaining about the, um, you know, how he was born in Mauritius. Um, because he set up the holding company in Mauritius, because everybody was going to Mauritius, but it comes at a cost. You know, Mauritius has been changing its laws because it's trying to um, make brand itself in a way that is more attractive to the OECD and the international community. Um, so they are changing their laws. So some benefits that you were able to get before suddenly it changes midway while you're trying to implement. Uh, and of course, you have to incur all those costs to put substance in that jurisdiction. So. Um, you don't need to be in a hurry to set up that foreign hold co. Um, you know, at the point in time where you want to attract the foreign investment, those guys would look at a structure for their investment. Um, and they are not going to be valuing your company based on the structure you have. Remember that Nigeria does not have any capital gains tax on disposal of shares. So Nigeria is actually attractive to actually sell your, your company um, and make a and make a capital gain because you you will not be taxed on on the profits you make from that capital appreciation. So those are some of the advice. Um, I know I would have missed one or two which came to my mind at the point in time, but I think it's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, before I follow up a question on you, I have Chris here in the studio. Chris, you are live and um, happy to have you here. So, put on with your comment or question. Uh, good evening. Thank you for session. It has been quite uh, informative and uh, educative. Um, I just wanted to quickly ask a um, question around um, the judicial decision from uh, River State about the uh, part and also the um conflicting uh, release uh, from uh FI ROS. So I need to check what, what's your view on on, on on that? I know the, the case is just uh, starting and uh, it looks like uh, to climb up uh, the legal uh, ladder and resolve it. What, what, what Um, Chris, you may have missed it, but we had dealt with that issue. Um, Ken had extensively um, given us his own view. Um, he has given us his views on the reverse judgment. And the uh, camera is a little, uh, your network is frozen. So while we wait for you to come back, um, I'll quickly ask him two questions on this formation of companies. So what you're saying is that once a company is formed, they can ratify the acts taking place before its formation, uh, unlike before, when only a company can take decisions on its own. But in doing that, I have seen investors want to see how the money was spent. Where was the money from? From whose account did it go? The receipts paid for. They really want to see proof. Uh, doesn't that make it easier if you were spending the money through the company while you were in the process of starting? Or do you have to keep very good records and then 
bring it into the company. Is that what you are recommending? Absolutely. So that's what I'm recommending. The level of record key doesn't really change, right? So you could actually, you could have a, you could have an, I could have two separate accounts. The only thing that a company account does is that it ring fences where I am spending from. But yes. I could actually, as an individual, actually set up, you know, I have the Zenith bank account. I can open a standard chartered account and use that solely for to route the cost that I'm incurring for the business. Okay. Um, and then my receipts, I keep my receipts just the way a company would keep the receipts. So um, it doesn't change the level of administration um, that you would need to, to do um, in between a, a pest, an individual and a company. One of the things that you should also think about, which will not have a receipt, is how much sweat equity you have put into the business. Because remember, you must pay yourself a salary, okay? But when you started, you know, you incubated the business um, and the time and effort that you put, you should be able to value that and say, well, if I had employed um, someone to do this, this is how much I would have paid the person and keep a record of that because that's um, sweat equity, even though based on, um, based on, um, if you wanted to contribute that to a company, you would have challenges. I, I, I agree with that. So, you know, for a company to actually pay you is, is actually easier or accrue the ability because the company may have no money to pay you. But you can actually book um, a salary um, that um, the company is supposed to pay you and say um, you, you book it as an expense and then you credit the liability. But the problem with that is that it will sit in liability, which therefore um, reduces the net assets of the company. So you really don't want that. Um, which is why at the end of the day, I still think it's better to, you know, just keep the record and say, this is when I started the business. I would have incurred this much on myself if I was paying myself a salary. And the investors understand that. You know, remember that many of these guys looking at the business. But they will pay you, they will now pay you the salary with the equity. Uh, we lost Ken here. Um, so, Chris, before you left us, I was saying that he had dealt with the problem of, um, he had dealt with issues of River State, the judgment. Uh, he's of the view that there is a constitutional lacuna, which maybe the Supreme Court may help to adjudicate on, but that truly the Constitution does not mention VAT, either in the exclusive or in the concurrent, and therefore um, that creates a lacuna that is that means that VAT is at the residual list. Only the states can really legislate on VAT. So he hopes the Supreme Court and the National Assembly will be able to sort out that lacuna. But that was his view on the um, on that issue. So okay. yes. So Ken, you can continue if we if you are here. Yeah, yeah. So I was saying that. Um, I was saying that remember that many of these, the investors that will be looking at your company, they started the business just like you. Many of them started the business in their garage, um, you know, similar to all tech startups. Um, so they understand how much sweat equity would have gone into the company while you were incubating the idea. Um, so the debates and the conversations around that will not be will not be difficult. So that was the point I was trying to make around valuing the effort which you which you put into the company during the incubation stage so you are saying that if you put up those um if you put up your time sheets and say this is my sweat equity so what you're saying is that you'll be paid with the shares of the company uh, for that sweat equity so it doesn't go into the liability absolutely absolutely okay. so it's better not to include it in all of that but in the conversations around the valuation uh, around the so that you then get the upside when you're disposing of the shares um, yes. in any event any gain you make on disposal of shares will be tax exempt 
Mm. Interesting. Chris, do you have any other question for him before we round it up? Uh, no, that's uh, the only question. I, actually, I, I, I joined uh, uh, late. Maybe that's why I missed out that uh, uh, portion. So I didn't know you, uh, you had already dealt with that. Mm. Yeah, thanks uh, for that. Thank no you very much. Okay, um, so on a final note, um, being from the um, tax world, as the oil revenues are declining, as the government is going to be facing severe budget um, shortfalls, um, where do you think our revenues are going to come from to run the country? <laughs> We're still going to rely on oil. <laughs> uh, so that is, that is, that is, that is, what should yeah, we begin yeah. to do now? So unless oil disappears today, remember yeah. we just signed the Petroleum Industry Act. And yes. that means that oil will still be in the conversation. But from a strategic point of view, government needs to be looking at life after oil because with energy transition, um, most companies will be going to zero carbon by 2050, um, mm -hmm. which means that we need to look, we need to go back to the drawing board and say, what were we doing right before? Remember, we used to play, you know, in the cocoa space right and the belt where cocoa can be grown properly nigeria is right there we you know but now the number one today is ivory coast which is a neighbor um so we can think strategically on whether we want to go back there and claim our top position in that space there's also the palm oil issue right that Indonesia has taken over um, I don't know how accurate it is. Maybe you will know. Um, but it is said that the palm kernels, um, which they used to grow their industry, were actually exported from West Africa, right? Um, so, but in every single cosmetic product. So when you go into the supermarket, I was, you know, reading an analysis that when you walk into a supermarket today, the, um, number of items that contains palm oil is around 50 percent okay so it's a very important um component to manufacture from creams to toothpaste to base for chemicals and everything so we we need to look at that 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 space but i mean and and why i am speaking to those um talking about these without talking about taxation is because you have to stimulate the economy first before you can see something to tax um and if there is no economy you cannot tax um so we cannot continue to rely on you know um the imports um which we've been relying on and the trade which we've been relying on so we need to think strategically look at those um agricultural products that we can play and then look at our competitive advantage and how we can play there for example um because of devaluation and because of the rates of churning out of um, um graduates we have a large workforce that speaks english and are educated now what did india do with that india simply looked at outsourcing as you know um a potential area where they could play and with the africa continental free trade agreement you know we can actually play better in that space um subject to how well we do in terms of improving electricity improving infrastructure and so on so there are lots that we can do from a strategic point of view as a country to stimulate the economy now if we stimulate the economy we then need to tax properly uh, um and as we said before and not to overflog it we need to improve taxation of individuals we need to improve identification of individuals and property we need to improve um on um our tax um culture as a country and once we do that, I think 
um, you know, we can correct a lot of things um, from, from, from a national perspective. Thank you very much. On that positive note, um, I would like to always end my uh, coffee chats on a positive note. Um, thank you, everybody, for joining us and for listening to this very enlightening conversation. Uh, the conversation will be available on my page for people to continue to watch. Um, so just click on it after the event. I uh, will upload and you can view it. But um, what is very critical today is the critical facts that have come out. Uh, there is a lie that has been in Nigeria that we need physical federalism um, in Nigeria. The truth is the major sources of revenue for um, governments in the world are uh, personal income tax. Not pay as you go only, but personal income. And it is domiciled with the Nigerian state. So if you like, work in the oil and gas industry, have all the staff in Port Harcourt, that should translate to income to River State government. Um, in terms of the federally collected revenues, we've seen that those are the easy taxes to collect. And more or less, those are taxes that need a central authority to collect because every state cannot go and set up at the port uh, to be taxing everybody to get their own share of revenue. So um, what is, uh, is missing today in Nigeria is that um, what we need today is to improve the capacity of the state uh, to perform its function. That's number one. Number two, there are no benefits to taking your company offshore, registering your companies offshore, even if you have global aspirations. Nigeria remains a good place. Investors will invest if the business is Nigeria-focused. And more importantly, uh, there are no capital gains taxes here, if I heard you correctly. So you can actually, at disposal of those shares, uh, make more money than you can make in most jurisdictions. And thirdly, personal income tax is not pay as you go. So our government should, should uh, desist from equating personal income tax to pay as you go. They should do the hard work of making sure that people who have properties record the rent as their income. Mm -hmm. People who have shares record it as their income. And the fact that we collect dividend withholding taxes um, should be part of what individuals will file to show that part of these taxes have been collected. But if individual goes beyond a certain threshold, then they pay more taxes because every jurisdiction normally have a threshold for the percentages of taxes that people pay. So, in other words, um, the work is at the state. Uh, normally, the bottleneck is at the top of the bottle, but today we have found out that um, for us to make progress as the country, we need to unlock Niger. And that Niger is that space where we don't look at uh, tongues and tribes, where we're not looking at who is from where, but what we're looking for is competence, is governance, is capacity, is effort. And at that point in your state, you can create all those things in your state without any recourse to other um, states or ethnic groups in Nigeria. The ball is definitely in the court of the state government. Failure to do so should not translate into the failure of Nigeria. Of course, Nigeria has its own issues. We're going to deal with those issues as we come. But the more important unlocking we need today is to unlock our potentials at our individual state. And taxes is a major source of revenue for that. For individuals, making sure your taxes are in order is a short pathway to making sure you get those foreign investors. It's a pathway to growing your business, making sure you can get loans because banks are going to look at turnovers, look at audited accounts to make decisions on who they loan money to. So thank you very much for joining us in this conversation. Um, hopefully, I'm going to take some of the questions here and send them to him, and I can come back on my page with written answers on some of them. Thank you, and God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you thank for you. your time. Yes, bye. Thank you. I appreciate it. Cheers, bye. Yes. Cheers.